I do not wish to appear here in any fault-finding spirit or as an impugner of the motives of those who believe that the time has come for this society to disband. I am conscious of no suspicion of the purity and excellence of the motives that animate the president of this society, Mr. William Lloyd Garrison, and other gentlemen who are in favor of its disbandment. I take this ground. Whether this constitutional amendment, the 13th, is law or not, whether it has been ratified by a sufficient number of states to make it law or not, I hold that the work of the abolitionists is not done. Even if every state in the Union had ratified that amendment, while the black man is confronted in the legislation of the South by the word white, our work as abolitionists, as I conceive it, is not done. I took the ground last night that the South, by unfriendly legislation, could make our liberty, under that provision, a delusion, a mockery, and a snare, and I hold that ground now. What advantage is a provision like this amendment to the black man if the legislator of any state can tomorrow declare that no black man's testimony shall be received in a court of law? Where are we then? Any wretch may enter the house of a black man and commit any violence he pleases. If he happens to do it only in the presence of black persons, he goes unwhipped of justice. And don't tell me that those people down there have become so just and honest all at once that they will not pass laws denying to black men the right to testify against white men in the courts of law. Why, our northern states have done it. Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio have done it. Here, in the midst of institutions that have gone forth from old Plymouth Rock, the black man has been excluded from testifying in the courts of law. And if the legislator of every southern state tomorrow pass a law declaring that no Negro shall testify in any courts of law, they will not violate that provision of the Constitution. Such laws exist now at the South, and they might exist under this pro provision of the Constitution that there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in any state of the Union. Slavery is not abolished until the black man has the ballot. While the legislators of the South retain the right to pass laws making any discrimination between black and white, slavery still lives there. As Edmund Quincy once said, while the word white is on the statute book of Massachusetts, Massachusetts is a slave state. While a black man can be turned out of a car in Massachusetts, Massachusetts is a slave state. While a slave can be taken from old Massachusetts, Massachusetts is a slave state. That is what I heard Edmund Quincy say 23 or 24 years ago. I never forget such a thing. Now, while the black man can be denied a vote, while the legislators of the South can take from him the right to keep and bear arms as they can, they would not allow a Negro to walk with a cane where I came from. They would not allow five of them to assemble together. The work of the abolitionists is not finished, notwithstanding the provision in the Constitution of the United States that the right to keep and bear arms shall not be abridged, the black man has never had the right either to keep or bear arms, and the legislators of the states will still have the power to forbid it under this amendment. They can carry on a system of unfriendly legislation, and will they not do it? Have they not got prejudice, prejudice there to do it with? Think you that because they are for the moment in the talons and beak of our glorious eagle instead of the slave being there as formerly that they are converted? I hear of the loyalty at Wilmington, the loyalty of South Carolina. What is it worth? Not a straw. They are loyal while they see 200,000 sable soldiers with glistening bayonets walking in their midst. But let the civil power of the South be restored and the old prejudices and hostility to the Negro will revive. Aye, the very fact that the Negro has been used to defeat this rebellion and strike down the standards of the Confederacy will be a stimulus to all their hatred, to all their malice, and lead them to legislate with greater stringency toward this class than ever before. The American people are bound by their sense of honor. I hope by their sense of honor, at least by a just sense of honor, to extend the franchise to the Negro. And I was going to say that the abolitionists of the American Anti-Slavery Society were bound to stand still and see the salvation of God until that work is done. 
where shall the black man look for support, my friends, if the American Anti-Slavery Society fails him? From whence shall we expect a certain sound from the trumpet of freedom when the old pioneer, when this society that has survived mobs and martyrdom and the combined efforts of priestcraft and statecraft to suppress it shall all at once subside on the mere intimation that the Constitution has been amended so that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall hereafter be allowed in this land. What did the slaveholders of Richmond say? To those who objected to arming the Negro on the grounds that it would make him a freeman. Why, they said, the argument is absurd. We may make these Negroes fight for us, but while we retain the political power of the South, we can keep them in their subordinate positions. That was the argument, and they were right. They might have employed the Negro to fight for him. And while they retained in their hands power to exclude him from the political rights, they could have reduced him to a condition similar to slavery. Of course, they would not call it slavery, but some other name. Slavery has been fruitful in giving itself names. It has been called the peculiar institution, the social system, and the impediment, as it was called by the General Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church. It has been called by a great many names, and it will call itself by yet another name. And you and I and all of us had better wait and see what new form this old monster will assume and what new skin this old snake will come forth.